Dr. Wes Robbins, and I'm here with Dr. Bruce Levine. And uh, Dr. Levine, I was just, as we were just talking briefly, I'm very, very grateful um, that to have this opportunity. So you, um, as a critical psychologist and the work that you have done in the field, I'm just honored to be able to sit with you and talk. And uh, just so you have a little bit of background about me, I did my PhD at the University of West Georgia um, in a psychology program, Consciousness and Society. So it has three different tracks, humanistic, transpersonal, and critical psychologies. And this is my life's work. My mom has her master's in behavioral analysis. My grandmother's got her EDD in psychology. And I have built a youth center that does mental health, humanistic, therapeutic work with teens, adolescents, and young adults and their families. But we do what's called radical youth work, a methodology that my committee, Dr. Hans Scott Meyer and Kathy Scott Meyer have worked on for 20 plus years, has a lot to do with... Um, you know, Dr. Hans Scott Meyer wouldn't even call himself a psychologist, if anything, very critical, anti-authoritarian, looking at and examining the pitfalls and deconstructing the fields of psychology and psychiatry in depth. And so one of our taglines that we use is rehumanizing. Um, we have, you are not broken, you are not sick, you are not damaged, you are not mentally ill, you are love, you are light, you are eternal strength. And we do a lot of empowerment work with youth. So when I was looking around at rehumanizing mental health, I became familiar with your work and in particular your work, uh, Madden America. And um, they several articles that you've written and has been published on there, but also your new work, um, your book, A Profession Without Reason. The Crisis of Contemporary Psychi Psychiatry Untangled and Solved by Spinoza, Free Thinking and Radical Enlightenment. And Dr. Levine, as soon as I hear Spinoza, I get excited. Um, so I'll let you know, my, my dissertation work was an autoethnography on addiction, and I weaved in my own personal lived experience of addiction with different theory, but I primarily utilized Deleuze and Guattari um Gil Deleuze and Felix Guattari and their work A Thousand Plateaus and um Rhizomes and Lines of Flight and then also Gregory Bateson and his work um Ecologies of the Mind and so Spinoza was a part of that um Gil Deleuze and Felix Guattari but in, in particular Gil Deleuze his his work that he's written about Spinoza and Spinoza's philosophy of imminence and his understanding of God and spirituality um, were beautifully impactful for me, not only in my academic study and research, but also um, in my personal life. So now I'm going to stop rambling, but I'm just, I'm jazzed. I'm, I'm jazzed. I'm excited. I feel like you are a hero in the field of uh, trailblazing what needs to be said about the archaic and damaging and abusive aspects of psychology and psychiatry. And so I'm so excited to get into this conversation, but I would love it if you could give a brief introduction, synopsis kind of of your work and where you're currently at and what you're currently focused on. Well, I would say it's sort of my work begins uh, probably when, you know, many, many years ago, 30 years ago, when I became increasingly embarrassed by the whole mental health profession. Um, the profession that I got interested in when I was uh, in high school and when I was an undergrad was much more anti-authoritarian, um, not completely so, but it had a lot of space. It had a lot of room. So, for example, in undergraduate, you would study people like uh, Stanley Milligram and uh, the obedience to authority, because back then, in the, at one point in the 1970s, people were much more concerned about issues of uh, compliance, and lead to Nazi Germany, leads to fascism, and then that's dramatically changed here in American society, as American society has become more authoritarian, so too has psychiatry, and so you see increasingly, especially we'll talk about kids, because I know that's a big interest for you, a radical, a radical youth, um, 
it's, um, you know, you see more and more kids who just are creating some degree of tension, some de degree of discomfort. This profession way back in the 1980s when they were coming up with things like oppositional defiant disorder. This was in the DSM-3, uh, 1980 DSM-3. They had, because of political protest, gotten rid of homosexuality as a mental illness. I, I talk to young people in their 20s, they're stunned and shocked that homosexuality yeah. was once a mental illness. And that's a big deal to understand that the only reason that that is no longer a mental illness was not because of psychiatry, because they were uptight by psych folks who were homosexual and they figured most of society was and that's really the criteria how anything becomes a mental illness if psychiatrists figure you know get uptight they're uncomfortable around somebody boom they stamp it mental illness <laughs> and yeah. um you know the reason why it was abolished was pure activism and that told a lot of america back in the 1970s it was abolished in 1973 that wait a minute you, you cannot abolish cancer by political activism um and so what the heck is all of these illnesses and diseases in this DSM. And so you had a, a very different era that I was interested in psychology. You had, like I said, the Milgram studies, you had these studies by David Rosenson that showed that psychiatrists couldn't really diagnose anybody, even if you believed in the validity of these particular mental illnesses, which scientifically I do not, there's not valid constructs. And even, you know, establishment psychiatrists are these days talking about throwing out the DSM um, people like Thomas Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health. So even if you believe in that, they're not reliable. So back in the 70s, what happened was psychiatry, since they really could not fix the science or lack of science in their whole profession, what they did was team up with drug companies. And they were proud of it. If you, you can read statements in the 1990s by the medical director of the American Psychiatric Association, a guy named Sapshin, talking about, you know, that, that we have this uh, proud partnership between us and the drug companies, and you didn't see any conflict there. So that's that's really how they reestablished their sort of power in society, not through any science. You know, every one theory after another is thrown out, and the latest theory to be thrown out is this chemical imbalance theory of depression, which finally, it was disproved, and then they held it, they kept it around. Why? Because it sold drugs. Well, ordinarily, would not buy, you know, back back 80, the vast majority of Americans were not one antidepressants if they were depressed. They figured it would pass, for, <clears throat> even though they knew that it, it was not true. But finally, now lately, even big shot establishment psychiatrists are acknowledging it. And so one after another, just a failure of the whole profession, even by establishment psychiatrists admitting DSM invalid, they're even admitting their outcome measures are horrific um, that, you know, just again, insulin and IMH director be, up until 2015, calling them abysmal, calling them bleak. So from even from the establishment, they, they realize their profession is once again in trouble and subject to being a laughing stock. And they're looking for anything to revive it. But as we'll get into here, they'll never, they never will be able to fix it because the core of it, and this is why guys like Spinoza are really important because that's what they cared about, really getting to the ultimate truth of why something was uh, either a true belief or, or a false belief. And the essential beliefs of psychiatry, which is much more a, a religion, it's very little to do with science. You'd be hard pressed to find anything scientific about the whole thing, but there's a lot of things that are very, very much parallel to organized religion. And the reason why they'll never fix it is because a core tenet of this religion is that people are acting problematically, not paying attention or traditional or substance abusing or depressed, anxious, all these things that their, their core religious value is, is because it's some sort of individual defect on and on. And once they think like that, they'll never, they'll, they just keep switching. You know, there's billions of dollars to be made coming in with one theory, throwing out the other. And they'll, and if they ever got to the truth that there is no defect, there is no individual defect that's causing people to behave in ways that may be self-destructively or destructive for other people, if they understood that, if they were willing to get to that, that would really kind of, you'd start disbanding the profession because you'd realize that the way to help a lot of these people, nothing to do with these silly, so attached to these this religious idea that people are behaving problematically because of this biochemical defect. Absolutely. And Dr. Levine, so, and I, I think, you know, I'm very um, intrigued by your boldness. I think it needs to be said. I think it's not being said. And you brought up so much for me right then. Um, I think about Michel Foucault's work, 
I think about the book on being crazy, R.D. Lang's work, Franco Basalia's work, all of these, the anti-psychiatry movement, counterculture. And so I'm, I'm actually also a co-host on WRFG, a community radio station here in Atlanta. And we have a show called On Your Mind that does work. It's got, um, I think, six different psychologists on it right now, but a pretty rogue, um, revolutionary show. And there used to be uh, an old uh, Atlanta magazine called The Great Speckled Bird. But I look at the counterculture movement of the 60s and the 70s and what they were doing to challenge, like you said, in an anti-authoritarian way to push the field in a certain direction. I'm curious, um, you know, because in most of my training, none of this happened until I got into a pretty unique doctoral program. And so in my bachelor's and my master's, um, never did I hear about R.D. Lang and Franco Basalia and Michel Foucault and Gil Deleuze and, um, you know, Ken Wilbur these individuals that were really trying to understand and critical psychology in general. So, you know, you say um, there can never be a revival or there can never be, one of my questions was gonna be, what is the forward frontier? Where do you think the most important work lies for critical psychologists like myself, for radical youth workers? How do we combat a system that is so notorious so large, so abusive, so systemically oppressing, where do we even start? And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm on a mission, Dr. Dr. Levine. This is my life's work. I'm 40 years old, and I plan to devote the rest of my years on this planet mm -hmm. to revolutionizing mental health work for youth in a way that, um, you know, I look at youth work, and I have several people on my team that aren't trained clinicians. And, but they are youth workers, and I've supervised and trained them in how to do deeply humanistic relational work. And so I guess my question to you is, as I look at this systemically, um, I'm trying to find a trajectory to kind of to fight through and build a coalition, almost a team of critical psychologists, rogue psychologists that are ready to challenge the field and are ready to create and form a new narrative around mental health, what it means to rehumanize mental health. And I'm just curious about um, your thoughts. Well, I think um, people, first of all, I wouldn't waste my time um, trying to persuade people who are establishment psychiatry, even establishment um, psychology into this way of thinking. Cause you know, they make, you know, they'll, they may say, oh yeah, I guess there's some over diagnosing and over medicalizing but that's as far as they're going to go. And they're not going to want to deal with the root radical notion here that your whole way of thinking is wrong. Um, and But there are a lot of folks out there who have understand that throughout American history, there have been major gigantic institutions that have just been totally wrong. Um, uh, they have been morally wrong. They have been unjust. And that it, and that you don't have to, you know, slavery, the House on American Activities Committee. And this is what psychiatry is going to be looked at some point 50, 100 years from now. And if you can't feel that and you can't see that, you can't really have a discussion. But there are a lot of people out there that they sense that. And uh, you talk to them, I'm sure. I talk to them all the time. And they, but they just are sort of intimidated by oh, all the, you guys have all the, these people have all these degrees and they've gone to all the schooling. And how could they be so wrong? And so, so for people who already kind of have a sense that maybe this is crazy, um, I'll give you know one, one thing that I'll talk about. Let's talk about kids. Let's talk about like their idea of like what's mental illness. Let's talk about like these guys actually think that there's something like oppositional defiant disorder, that if you often argue with adults, you'll often refuse to comply with adults, are irritated by adults, you have a disease, you have a disorder, and more and more of these kids are, are actually drugged. You know, and so they also, they also too, that, that a lot of folks I find just laugh at, but when I get to a couple of these other things, people are, are, they're just really, they're shocked. They actually even think I'm, I'm, I'm being satirical here. Even yeah. when I talk about preschool ADHD and they're like, how could a three-year-old, how could a three-year-old have ADHD? How can I, they go, what, what are the symptoms? I'm going like, oh, a lot of these don't pay enough attention to detail. We're talking about a three-year-old. We're talking yeah. about a, somebody who doesn't wait 
until the question is asked before they respond to the question. Somebody who talks louder than their peers, who doesn't wait for instructions. This is a three-year-old. And then I say, well, it gets even worse. There's something called pediatric bipolar disorder. By the way, this was uh, never even, when I was, uh, you know, your age, or, you know, when I was a young, a little younger in graduate school, there's very few adults even got labeled with bipolar, which they used to call manic depressive. Yeah. They're very few. It's very rare. Now it's, you know, the they just label anybody who's a little moody with that. But never, you'd almost never see a kid, especially a three, four year old, labeled with bipolar. It's just insane because yeah. what are the symptoms? You know, excessively, extremely moody. You know, what a, a, a kid who, a kid who's like, a, talks too fast. I mean, a kid who's <laughs> like, I like one of my, one of my favorite ones is, uh, is a uh, show's, um, shows in, 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 you know, a lot of silliness, incessant silliness uh, for a long <laughs> period of time. You know, I mean, that's like the whole psychiatric profession. And so these things become silly. People are laughing. <laughs> but then I go through, this is not really any laughing matter. And I don't know if you recall, because, you know, you might remember the whole case of a Rebecca Riley. I don't know if that little girl's name means anything to you. But if not, if your audience has never heard of her, this became a major um, news story, actually, for even the mainstream world. And back in 2007, uh, 60 Minutes ran a story on it. And again, it's very instructive, just like the whole issue of homosexuality. It's very instructive to get a feel of just how, how completely insane, psychotic by their own death, crazy, not in touch with humanity, psychiatry is. So you got a, a little girl who's not even two and a half years old, 28 months. Rebecca, it's in Massachusetts, and her parents take her to this psychiatrist who's associated with Tufts New England Medical Center. And this psychiatrist's name is Cavucci. And so the, the parent is, says to the psychiatrist, well, she's, she's very hyper. She, she doesn't go to sleep, you know. And so the psychiatrist diagnoses her with preschool ADHD. And she, before she's even three, um, uh, clonidine, clonidine, this mm -hmm. Hypertensive, heavily sedating, hypertensive. Then comes back with the real agitated here. She's crying all the time here, and I don't know what to do. And then a psychiatrist diagnoses her with pediatric bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. which was very big there in Massachusetts because the head, one of the biggest thought leaders in psychiatry, and a guy named Joseph Biederman out of Harvard and Mass General, he 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 brought this into the university here. <laughs> he fathered it. You know this. Later on, Congress, by the way, finds out a few years later, he got $1.6 million companies. And so anyways, wow. so this little girl's on all of these drugs, you know, clonidine and Seroquel for the for her bipolar, Depakote, which is a mood stabilizer, so antipsychotic. She's on all of these things. Four years old, what happens to Rebecca Riley? She dies. Medical examiner says these drugs killed her, especially the clonidine, but, you know, the other, all these well, because they were not, they were pretty horrible people. It turns out it looked like they were doing this whole trip here to try to get her a more and more severe disability so that they, that they could get social security disability to jury. But the interesting thing is they were both convicted. One in the, at the mother's trial, one of the jurors says, you know, I want to speak for all our jurors, all the arrested jurors. We thought the psychiatrist should, should be on trial too. Okay, that's what the juror said. Well, it was interesting in the 60 Minutes report, the reporter then was, uh, I don't know if you remember Katie Couric, but you can't yeah. be more mainstream, mainstream media than Katie Couric. She was a reporter. She, she got a, a statement from Tufts New England Medical Center. And this is really interesting. They, you know, was Tufts going to say, oh, were they, were they going to just say, well, Kabuchi was just a bad apple. That's not the way we practice. No, they didn't say that at all. What they said was this, and this is pretty much, I think it's an exact quote or almost. They said, they said the care we provided uh, was appropriate and within professional responsible professional standards you kill the three-year-old you kill yeah. the four-year-old with all of these drugs and you're calling that and and so that's the kind of stuff that i think even you can see katie card's face you know she doesn't say really you know but on her face yeah. it's like you got to be kidding and so i think part of like it's a kind of an emperor's new clothes phenomenon here i think is what i experienced a lot that the, the emperor's got no brains, no science, no humanity. This is the emperor's psychiatry. And people just need to, 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 say, to see this. And yeah. once you do that, then the next question is, is like, they'll get, well, 
Well, Bruce, you know, what would you do with these kids? Would you just leave them alone, these disruptive kids who are not paying attention, not complying? Well, we can talk a lot about that here, but I can give you just right off the top of my head, like six or seven reasons why kids behave disruptively. I'm sure you'd come up with three or four, you know, whatever more, and what that would lead to. But, you know, just before we get into that, or if you're interested, I'd be glad to do that. But you know, the key thing is here, think about it. You're some disruptive kid out there. Like, what do you want? You want some, the adult world sitting around figuring out with your preschool ADHD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Is that what you want? Or you want some adult, some psychiatrist, some parents to be thinking like, wow, what's going on with you? How come you're acting like this? Why are you not paying attention? Why are you disobeying everybody? Yeah. Why are you crying all the time? And and trying to understand. So you you would want, anybody would want some curiosity and some compassion, right? And that yeah. this profession does, psychiatrists do none of that. They do none of that at all. I mean, most of them don't even talk to folks. They just listen to symptoms and they, they just prescribe tweak medications. Now, unfortunately, the rest of what we're doing, psychologists, social workers, we used to be very different, completely different. than yeah, so like, But Dr. Levine, I, man, so profound. And I love how direct you are because you're right. In the field of psychology and psychiatry, you only get supporters, but they will never talk about the, the truth that you're naming the Spinozian truth that you're naming, which is the entire field is based on a false platform and, and a conceptual framework that overly pathologizes the individual and only looks at a diseased, broken individual. And so I work with so many youth where so much of this is helping them change their cognitive narrative about self worldview and society at large because i'm watching so many young people on tiktok on instagram on different social media platforms begin to find identity and connection through romanticizing pathology through romanticizing mental illness diagnoses and it's very hard because as as a psychologist you know i have to work very delicately to help them unravel that narrative because if you come in and you say I don't even believe that you're borderline. I don't even believe in the conceptual framework of this particular diagnosis. You'll get a lot of young people who will go, you don't understand me. I'm going to go to somebody who does. And so a lot of the work that I do is very delicate, very slow in, in informing, in educating, and in helping these young people recognize. Let's look at the history of mental health. Let's look at how the DSM formed. Let's look at what di diagnostic criteria are. And let's try and understand who you are as a human soul outside of these guidelines or structured pathology trying to describe you. And you're right. We live in a world where that system, if you wear orange sweater too much, you have orange sweater syndrome. And, and there's no process. It becomes this internalization of being broken, being damaged, being mentally ill and it's creating and perpetuating. And so my fight is to help young people see their beauty, see their strength, see their holistic human soul, and then have these social connections to be able to heal in a tribal type way with one another, but to not see themselves as damaged or broken. And I think it, I think it becomes very hard because on some level, you know, we also work with quite a bit of neurodivergent kids and young people who have autism. And I have a daughter who's nine years old, beautiful. She's an angel. She's incredible. She's amazing, but she's um, incredibly neurodivergent. So she has autism if we want to utilize that framework. And there's a lot I understand and a beautiful book called Neuro Tribes that really talks about, you know, all the different lenses of it. But she also has a genetic deletion, something called 16P11.2 genetic deletion syndrome. And so, you know, it's so hard for me to help other human beings see the complex nature of their biology, their um, neurology, their immunology, their physiology, their psychology, their emotions, their social, and to recognize that none of these are really separate and, and, and they move and they weave and they flow together in these different ways. So I think, you know, one of the challenges is the balance of it all comes back to me. How do you help somebody live their best life? And how do you how do you lessen human suffering? 
and 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 what does that look like for each unique individual especially for young people on their radical pilgrimage of growth on their identity development peer relationships connection to self spiritual growth um i'm curious you know i work with these families repeatedly who have young people that are having severe symptoms or severe emotional disruption and i and i support what you say completely because i'm like all of this is a symptomology that is manifesting that has a greater internal root and we have to ask the question why what is going on for this young person and typically what i see heal more than anything is connection is relationship is sacred space is meaning purpose victor frankl logo therapy tuning into purpose and identity and connection. I guess my question, Dr. Levine, as I go through all this is, you know, um, what are your thoughts with, with such things as, um, you know, if we do, if we, if we get rid of psychiatry and we get rid of psychology, what takes its place and, and how do we help people categorize and heal and have, um, support and and alleviate human suffering. Well, I think the first response to that is there are a lot of people who <clears throat> are considered anti psychiatrists who really aren't. I mean, you know, you know, a lot of folks want to just abolish psychiatry. My feeling is is that it's it's a religion, and you know, people should have freedom of religion. Which I have to tell you, this is the same view that Thomas Sass had. And this has got to be much more trouble than being an anti-psychiatrist or saying to abolish it, because that is like what psychiatry doesn't really want to deal with is the truth that it is just the religion and people should, you know, it's guaranteed by our Bill of Rights here, people should have freedom of religion. And so, you know, my, my feeling is, is that if there, there's going to be a certain number of people who are listening to what you and I are talking about here. And they're going to be validated. They're going to, in, they have already intuitively felt a lot of these things that you and I are talking about. And it's going to be helpful for them to hear a couple of guys like us with a few degrees, you know, a few letters behind our name actually say this, say what they're already feeling. And so that's of use. There's going to be other people out there who have bought into this psychiatry religion. All right. They have bought into the idea that, for example, and I, young people show me this all the time, the ones who, you know, the ones who I'm helping, they'll, they'll say, Bruce, you're going to get killed out there. Look at these Tumblr accounts with these people in their profile, their profile, they list themselves as borderline personality, just which I should say, you know, among psychiatrists that, you know, those people are the, maybe more of a pariah than even schizophrenics. They're, they're terrified. They're, they're scared of dealing with somebody who might be like a Glenn Close and fatal attractions. That's what they would call a borderline, but these people glob onto you know, their whatever there is, their bipolar disorder, their whatever. And and so I guess the interesting intellectual question for me is we can get to whether you could do anything about this therapeutically or not. That's a whole other issue. But intellectually is like, why is it? Why is it that they want to glob on to these labels? Well, one of the things is that psychiatry with all their money, all their power and all the drug companies behind them, they have affected so many things out there. And one of the things they've created in mass media. So, you know, by all their with their advising on television, the mass media is dependent on them. <laughs> the mass media doesn't want drug companies to pull, pull their advertising dollars from them. So the mass media kind of parrots pretty much what psychiatry wants them to say. Pill shamers or something like that. There must be something you know really wrong with them. You know, there must be problematic people here. And, um, and then there are people there who uh, will say that, um, that, that, you know, that, that, you know, that out there for these folks they're looking at is that either, you know, I'm I love your framework, freedom of religion, psychiatry and psychology is a religion. People are free mm -hmm. to believe what they want to believe and practice what they want to practice. You know, I, I have this burning desire. I, I really, I want to be um, as influential as Artie Lang, as influential as Franco Battaglia, mm -hmm. as influential as these, these pioneers, you know, that, that really, mm -hmm. and th there are a few psychologists that really um, inspired me, like Eric Fromm, Victor Frankl, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I just believe in the ability to shift the conscious narrative and 
you know, so that brings me to my next point. I, I, I do, um, you know, the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s is very inspirational to me and the anti-psychiatry, mm -hmm. what they were doing. And I think with enough devoted counselors, social workers, and psychologists, we can do another counterculture movement. But I'm curious to know your thoughts on, you know, when we look at psychiatry, when we look at psychotropic medication, when we look at psychopharmacology, um, what are your thoughts on psychedelics and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy? And what's on the horizon with the work at MAPS and the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies? Do you feel like in any way this is going to combat some of the, um, you know, really heavy use of psychiatric medication and move people to more uh, plant-based medicines and working with them? Well, historically, what psychiatry has done is the kind of game book of most authoritarian <laughs> um, institutions is they first sort of ignore, then they fight and laugh at, and then they co-op. And so you see that really is going on a lot. Like, so for example, one of the really great movements that a lot of psychi psychiatric survivor activists um, did starting in the 1960s, 70s was to say the hell with psychiatry. We're not going to use you guys at all. We're better helping each other. And they had this thing, you know, peer-to-peer -peer support, like mutual aid. It was a basic notion of anarchism, non-hierarchical mutual aid. Um, AA did that too. Initially, it was uh, one of the the founders, the major founder of AA, a guy named Bill Wilson. He loved this kind of anarchist principle of Peter Kropotkin, who wrote this book called Mutual Aid, and he, he really believed that. And so, you know, medical establishment tried to fight AA. You know, they didn't want it around, and then eventually they couldn't. It became too big a deal, and so they co-opted it. What did that mean? So they they took this thing and they started sticking it there. 30,000 month, uh, you know, hospital, you know, <laughs> treatment centers, and they, you know, the courts would uh, refer people to these 12 step meetings, and they would have in a 12 step meeting, they would have people who who aren't voluntary. <laughs> and that ruins everything. You can't have, you know, that ruined the whole <laughs> spirit of it. And Bill Wilson would have known that. He would have known that once you have anybody there who's not wanting to be there, the whole way that worked, and it doesn't work for everybody. I'm not, you know, AA is a kind of religion too that works for a lot of people, and it doesn't work for everybody. But the way it really can work for people is when you the, the nature of that. It was a he, Bill Wilson was a kind of anti-authoritarian guy, and he knew that a lot of substance abusers were also like that <laughs> and he wanted to create a create a scene where they would be non-hierarchical helping each other all that stuff and once you have people once you have a co-opted you know and courts are sending people there forcing people to be there you lose the whole spirit of yeah. what that's about and the same thing is happening with this peer-to-peer -peer support where you know now you have peer specialists who are getting paid nominal fees you know and work you know, get a job in hospitals and God love it. I mean, I get, you know, it's, it's an upgrade to, for many of these folks to have any job at all. So I understand why they do it. But what, what happens is often is they're at the bottom. Now they're at the bottom of a hierarchy, the whole spirit of peer to peer support where we define what we are. We don't let some psychiatrist call us schizophrenic or any goddamn thing. You know, we call ourselves what we want to call ourselves and we help each other. That was peer to peer support. It was empowerment kind of movement. And the idea that we're now at the bottom of a, of a hierarchy, you know, and even, you know, we're getting paid, it just, again, co-ops it. And we could talk about, it. I have some ideas about how psychiatry, because they have, are more and more accepting the failure of their latest so-called miracle drug, the SSRIs and all these antidepressants, what they're, they're needing a new miracle drug. And, you know, they've done this historically before with cocaine and amphetamines for depression, then SSRIs, and now they're going to co-op psychedelics. And from my guess is that they're going to be using these things ultimately in a way that a lot of people didn't get, you know, in a way very different than how people have got some positive experience about how using them. And so they're going to be using them in, in these kind of micro dosing ways that are much more similar to the way people are medicated with SSRIs. That's my, that's my guess. I don't know how it Dr. Play Levine, out. I think, I think you're a thousand percent right. I think that's headed down the pipeline, you know, and there's a large symposium that's going to happen in Colorado in June put on by maps and they're doing their best to have a variety of speakers and to have cultural, you know, uh, thought leaders to be there to talk about the cultural roots of ayahuasca, aboga, wachuma, the entheogens, the plant medicines. But I think you're right. I think it's inevitable that that system 
of psychiatry is going to co-opt and eat those things up. And I love what you said. I mean, Dr. Levine, it's so your work, you know, I, my hope is that us as critical psychologists, you and I, and speaking this and speaking this truth can really make people feel the way I feel when I first watched your videos. And when you just talked right then and you said, we call ourselves whatever the fuck we want to call ourselves. Like we as a community define health. We as a community, because, you know, I look at, I look at um, Michelle Foucault's work and how much he talked about disciplinary power and then biopower and then Deleuze's work on societies of control. And you're right. Everything becomes about functionality and feeding you into a system to make sure that you are cooperating and behaving in a particular way and conforming. So now normalcy and mental health equals conforming. And that's quote unquote healthy. And I, I get very concerned about it. And, you know, one of our, one of my missions here, we have an 8,500 square foot space. We have a music arena. We have a ceramic studio. We have art. I have a team of 10. Two of them are licensed clinicians or excuse me, three of them are licensed clinicians. Five of them are these radical youth workers that I've trained in this humanistic work. We do free community events and we have all this beautiful work happening. And, you know, one of the things that I say is we don't need another mental health treatment center. We need community centers that have humanistic care for one another that are inherently therapeutically beneficial. So it's what is true therapeutic healing has very little to do with a licensed clinical professional sitting in front of you. It has everything to do with a community where you feel safe, you feel heard, and you have purpose and connection with people. And so I think we've lost that with the YMCAs, with the Boys and Girls Club, with all these things, because youth are hungry to do therapeutic growth work. They've just been put into this system and the psychiatric hospitals are horrific. The psychiatric inpatient stabilization and what those have done has been debilitating for these young people in so many ways. So that's, that's my mission moving forward is to create more centers and community youth centers that have this really unique blend of mentorship, caring, peer support, um, that young people are excited about because that's when we start to see symptomology, anxiety, depression, self-harm, substance abuse, suicidality, these very real things start to dissipate when these young people feel connected, feel tuned in, find something they're passionate about, feel like they can actually be somebody in the world and aren't disillusioned with the whole of journey of life. And so I think what you said is, is absolutely beautiful. I'm just, I'm, I'm really grateful for you because um, as I do this work, I get hungrier and hungrier to be a thought leader, to be it because not many people, Dr. Levine, are brave enough to say what you're saying. And they worry about the ramifications of their professional career if they speak out in the way that you are. And so your bravery, you being a trailblazer, um, I'm grateful for places like Madden America and doing the work that they're doing. Um, I'm, I'm just curious if you feel like there's anybody, do you feel alone in this or do you feel like you have support? Well, I feel that there are other people around the world, um, and I talk about them all the time, who are dissenting, dissident mental health professionals, a handful of psychiatrists, the most recent one, you know, one who's gotten a lot of name recently is this uh, Joanna Moncrief, who came out in uh, in uh, last year with this review on all these uh, research on serotonin and balance theory and showed definitively that there was no relationship at all between serotonin levels and depression. And then they, the establishment psychiatry attacked her. They actually belittled her, actually saying like, well, we've been saying that for years. And so they kind of tried to gaslight the world like this, like everybody knows this, we, we haven't said this. And so there's people like her, there's other folks in history, a psychiatrist, a, a guy who I met before the house, he was a, back, back in the 1970s again, 
you could be more of a kind of critical thinker, even in psychiatry. So he had created this thing called Soteria has S-O-T-E-R-I-A, which is basically a respite place for folks who had flipped out, who had had these breaks, psychotic breaks, whatever you want to call them. And it was completely different than a hospitalization and it worked really well. And he was National Institute of Mental Health. He was a director of schizophrenia studies. But when this thing started working well and the authoritarian climate in psychiatry and in the whole USA changed in 1980, he gets fired. So he was he's pretty angry. And so I know pretty much most of the folks I know, nothing really horrible has happened to me here. I haven't lost my license yet or nobody's tried to do anything really horrible to me yet. But a lot of other folks, you know, especially psychiatrists and, and some psychologists, they, they paid career prices. They can't get into university departments. Um, but, you know, for me, it's just it's very it's it, there's just really no choice. Do you want to be somebody who is part of a system that is part of institutional child abuse? And, you know, I don't know what else you would call, like, for example, what happened with Rebecca Riley that I described before or what's happening to kids all over the place, except institutional child abuse. I don't, I, I, you know, there's no choice for anybody who's got like a half a soul <laughs> and a half a brain to like speak out against this kind of thing. And when you're doing this stuff as long as I've been doing is you, you start to understand the political landscape. It, it's really going to be hard to change these things at a giant level. I mean, I don't, you know, I want to get people depressed, but this is not just the Guild of American Psychiatry. <clears throat> it's the entire kind of powers that be, the ruling class. They very much need to have people believing that their lives are miserable, that they're substance abusing, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're suicidal, because there's something wrong with them. Something wrong with you. <laughs> they don't care what it is. They don't care if you believe it's your genetics. They don't compare if it's your, you know, bipolar disorder, biochemical. They don't care. But what they don't want is people to start believing, like, well, maybe a big part of why I'm this miserable is my alienating, crappy job where I'm moving boxes around for Amazon all day long with my hundred thousand dollar student debt and blah 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 and all of these kinds of things. Because we know, you and I know. The fuel of, say, depression is overwhelming pain and pain of, you know, miserable job, loneliness, miserable relationship, um, all of these existential pains of not, not knowing what the heck you're doing with your life. And so they don't want you to kind of think like, well, maybe a big part of why I'm having so much problems is I'm living in a world that's set up to just make rich people richer. They don't, they don't want you thinking like that. So there's all of these powerful forces out there besides drug companies and besides psychiatry that, that, are, that are working real hard to make people like you and I completely marginalized, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, you know, that, 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 that's happening. But the good news here is, and this spoke of the kind of insane societal wheel, of which there are many spokes. Uh, yeah, it was a book that I wrote you know, in 2001 called Common Sense Rebellion, talked about a lot of the different spokes. Psychiatry being only one spoke, school systems are another spoke. There's a lot of spokes in the insane societal wheel. But the one good thing in this spoke is that you can do some things um, as I talk about, you know, in, in A Profession Without Reason and some of my articles, there are people who are doing things underground, below the radar, like yourself, and all over the place that I run into talking to folks who are pulling things off, and they're, they're really enjoying themselves. And, you know, the good news is, is as you all know, you know, most of our colleagues out there who are buying into that basically manipulation control mode, whether it's behavior modification or their drug manipulation, they're getting burned out left and right because that's what happens when you try to control human beings left and right. You burn out. Whereas, you know, people like yourself, people like me, we, we're not burnt out because we're having a good time. We're curious about people. We're yeah. interested. We're trying to help them connect with themselves, connect with other people. That's exciting. You don't get burned out when you do that kind of stuff. Dr. Levine, I got, man, I just want to tell you, I love you, brother. Like, come <laughs> on, man. That was it. That was gold. Like, oh, and you're so right. It's like, man, at the heart, I care about people. I care about sitting with a young person, really understanding who they are and what they want from their life. And, and when you talk about disillusionment with the world, you know, Dr. Kathleen Scott Meyer, um, who's been a profound impact in my life. She told me a story a long time ago about an old fable, and it was a villager walking down by a stream and seeing a baby floating in the stream. And he jumps in, grabs the baby, pulls it to dry land. Walks a little bit further, sees two babies, jumps in, grabs them, pulls them to dry land. Walks a little bit further, sees three, jumps in. 
And at one point, the villager has to decide, do I continue to walk downstream and pull babies out of the stream, or do I walk stream to figure out why so many babies are getting into this stream? And that is my work. That's what took me from private practice to taking absolutely no money, following my vision, building an organic youth center, and starting to build a team, build an army of humanistic healers that believe in the human soul, that believe in community, that believe in connection and true healing. And now I'm at a level where I want to do what I can, and I just want to grow it from my own backyard. So our, our current, um, I just came before I spoke to you, a beautiful uh, city council meeting, Alpharetta and Milton, and I have all these different connections and looking to grow and make as much positive systemic change as I can as a thought leader. And, you know, I pull back, you know, all the time and I go, I focus on the macro, but I pull back and I have two little daughters. And so my work starts right there with my own children, with my own wife, with my home, with my family, and then who I am as a father, a husband, and a healer with these youth that we serve at the center. But I'm telling you right now, you are a trailblazer, sir. And, and your work and the fact that you wove in Spinoza, come on. That was like the coolest ever. Right. Well, the reason, you know, for me, I, I, I wanted to bring him in there for a lot of reasons. One is that for me, that this whole pseudoscience, this religion of psychiatry had actually become so boring. It was just ridiculous. And I wanted to kind of figure out some kind of way to make it interesting again and kind of, you know, the, if, you know, reading, I'm sure you read the book there, you see that a lot of what I'm doing is explaining Spinoza's life, his philosophy, and how he would look at contemporary psychiatry. Um, you know, he was probably one of the most famous critics of organized religion in, in history, got himself into a lot for that it was sort of a miracle. He didn't get thrown in jail and, and, and put to death. But, um, you know, he got ostracized and a whole bunch of things happened to him. But I think, I think that, you know, there's there's lot, lots of folks throughout history who have kind of taken some things out there, some organized religion. I don't see anything that, you know, organized. Yeah, you know, but I should I, maybe a little explain what I mean. Why it's, so I wrote a piece a, a few uh, a few months back about comparing that that establishment psychiatrists have actually without they're sort of unwittingly acknowledged that psychiatry is a religion. They've they've said that, yeah, we knew that the chemical imbalance theory was untrue, but it was useful to kind of convince people to act right, which is like what religion is. There's a difference. Science and philosophy gets to the truth of things. Yeah. A big part of what religion is at its best is trying to kind of get people through nar narratives and fictions and stories to act good, to act right. Now, the problem is psychiatry's religion, their idea of acting right, you know, is not, you know, love and charity and justice, which is, you know, for some religions, you know, their idea of acting right is getting people to take their med. If you look at what DSM, DSM-4, he's used that word bullshit. He called diagnosis bullshit. And he said, but, you know, a lot of false beliefs help people cope, which gets back to what you're talking about with these young people who attach themselves to these diagnoses because they believe it's the only way that people will care about them and, and give them compassion. And that's the, really the tragedy. And yeah. you could spend some time saying like, you know, there's other ways besides, you know, sort of confessing to a mental illness that you can get people to be curious, to care and to have compassion. But, you know, that's not what they're hearing out there. And so, you know, sometimes you, you can you can have a dialogue with folks, have them think like they don't have to like label themselves with a mental illness right, and disease right. for life to get understanding and compassion. Some people get that, but some people just they're just closed to that idea. Just again, same as religion. There was plenty of people who just have an attached view of politics and religion, and they're not really open, free think wanting to get to the truth of things. And that's just the way it's always been that kind of thing. And I don't think that'll ever change. Yeah, I agree. And Dr. Levine, I'm just grateful for you because I feel like what you've been able to do is you've been able to gather this research, these studies, these resources so that you can combat that large narrative. Because you're right, people hand over, you know, to the doctor or to um, cognitive neuroscience. It's like they completely let go of their critical thinking. And, and they see that as the end-all, be-all, and it is very hierarchical. So an individual like yourself, who is well-studied, who has critical thinking, who has the appropriate 
you know, um, like you said, degrees and study, you have the ability to bring in all of this and show people you're being duped, you're being lied to, you're being fed into a system that has a vested interest in keeping you sick, in keeping you damaged, and in making sure that you can ply and perform in a certain way behaviorally. And I think it's going to take just as much astute professionalism and um, intellectualism to combat that narrative so that people can say, well, wait a minute, these doctors said something different and they are fighting a different fight and a different journey. So Dr. Levine, I'm, I'm just honored. I, I would love, I, I want to be mindful of your time. And so we can, I think, I think just the last, yeah, the last thing I know we, you know, we can, we can cut now, but I mean, the last thing off of what you're saying, I think is real important. And I think it's that to understand what you and I have to understand, that we, you know, is, is to, to think about is that people, when they're scared, when they're afraid, their, their critical thinking uh, goes down the toilet. And so you and I both know a lot of people who seem to be pretty intelligent and critical thinking about a lot of areas of life. But when they see something themselves or something, oh, they're acting in some bizarre, it so frightens them that why I try to inoculate people, vaccinate people to the idea that know that when you're frightened, you're vulnerable to somebody coming along who sounds like they know what they're talking about. And this is in politics. This is in psychiatry. This is in all areas of life. You're vulnerable to somebody. And you and I know real well, psychiatry knows nothing about science, but they're very good. These guys go to school and learn how to sound like they know what they're talking about, exude confidence and authority. You know, and when you're scared, yeah. you know, your intuition about bullshit, you know, isn't as good. And you're just right. more willing to kind of buy in. And I've talked to many a parent who said, you know, when my kids were having a hard time, every part of my intuition said, no, they're not mentally ill. I know it's because we're going through this rough divorce and they're not dealing with it real well or something human. And, and when they told me to put my kid on Prozac or Paxil or Adderall, all these medications, my gut told me, don't do it, don't do it. But they were vulnerable because they were scared and, and they allowed some authority to kind of control them. So I think maybe that's the most important lesson that, that you and I need to, you know, part of why maybe the most important thing that you and I do is to sort of model not being afraid. What are they going to do? Shoot us? Not <laughs> likely. Most likely. Most likely. I mean, I don't, at my, my age, I don't care. Keep me out of a nursing home, you know? What the hell? <laughs> But, but even if I was your age, even if I was your age, you know, and, and, you know, it's like, they're not, they're not going to shoot us. They're just going to ignore us. That's, or they're going to laugh at us. That's, that's, that's what they do. You know, I say, you know, first they, first they ignore us, then they laugh at you. Then they, and then, and then they're probably still not going to kill us. They'll just co-opt us. So there's really not that much to be afraid of. And, and part of it is if we can project like not being so afraid and other people that becomes contagious then people get their brains back. So there's a lot of people out there who are highly intelligent and they're just, they just, you know, they're just so scared. They're not using their brain and their intuition. And that's what, that's, I think one of the most helpful things that we can do. And that's, that, that's why I, I, I that's why I, I try, I try to project that there to kind of give people that experience here, you know, because it, it, it's like, I'm confident that once I could get people, and this is one of the most horrible things about our profession besides the medication is they get people more scared. You know, you and I know that if to do our jobs right, if we've got some parents who are already frightened about what their kids are doing, our major job is to de-escalate their fear so they could use their brains again. And so they could be thoughtful that we could come up to some kind of plan that makes actual sense. And, and our colleagues, a lot of these folks, they get these people more scared, you yeah. know, and so. That's that's a big part of what we wanted to not only just intellectually educate people, but reduce people's fear out there. Beautifully said. And Dr. Levine, you're, you're so right. And and the ability, you know, I'm so fortunate. We're, we're serving 70 families right now. I've worked with hundreds of families over the years, and I feel like it is sacred. And I'm honored because they they we can build a trust and they will begin to listen. And again, oftentimes it's not listening to me as an expert, giving them some knowledge that they don't already have. It's them listening to me and feeling safe enough to trust themselves again, to trust their own critical thinking, to trust their own intuition, and to realign them with themselves. And so I think you're right. If we can combat fear and we can help people come back into themselves and realign with self and have critical thinking, they have everything that they need. It's just the ability to help them 
kind of pull the the wool from their eyes and see clearly what they've always seen if they can look at it um dr levine this has been you brother this has been one of the coolest if not the coolest podcast that i've done because it's hit so close to home with my mission and you know i've talked to some really interesting people but i would absolutely love if you and i can stay in contact and i can bounce some things off of you because i really admire what you're doing and and the trailblazing you're i want to say thank you so much for being on here thank you wes it's been a pleasure i enjoyed it awesome